Hello and welcome to the podcast. Today we are honored to have Mr. Andy Sheckman, owner of Miles Franklin Precious Metals, uh, joining us for our monthly symposium on the latest dealing with the financial landscape of things and the reset. And he's going to be offering his professional uh, subject matter expert musings on all the questions today. Now, again, if you are new to the channel, please do like, subscribe, and share as it helps the channel grow and helps others get the knowledge you've been afforded. Andy, welcome to the podcast. Always an honor to have you here. Good to be here, John. Thanks for having me, brother. I appreciate it. Easy decision. So I got a lot of questions I'm keen to get your take on, and I know the audience is as well. So we'll start right off the bat. Um, last week, uh, we, in conjunction with many others, broke the story that you're well aware that uh, the longstanding agreement the U.S. had with the petrodollar with bin Sal Mohammed bin Salman, the latest uh, or the most current uh, uh, Saudi prince, has now formally announced that Saudi Arabia, as of this Sunday the 9th, is no longer backing the petrodollar, which would obviously lead you to believe that they're going like the rest of the world in BRICS asset backed, because that would be the natural alternative. My question to you is, um, what happens to the dollar as a result of that decision? And was that the last uh, was that the last point of reference that they would be able to prop up the dollar going forward? Well, I guess we have to see. I mean, we're just a few days away to see if it does happen. I mean, look, it's it's plausible. I've been saying this for four years that it ultimately would happen. I've never focused on a date, but I mean, from a standpoint of logic, look, um, it was 50 years ago this week that that Kissinger signed the petrodollar deal with the Saudis. And even more uh, interesting, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia recently said that China was their most important trading partner for oil in 2023 and will be for the next 50 years. Now, you could argue those words were chosen very carefully. But the synthetic demand that was created by for the dollar and the treasury, because people forget it's not just pricing oil in dollars, it's taking the excess reserves and putting them, recycling them, as they call it, back into U.S. treasuries. So when you talk about the double whammy of, of the fact that every country on the planet's had to stockpile dollars for 50 years in order to buy oil has created a synthetic demand for a currency that would no longer be needed. Uh, and the byproduct of that would be massive global dumping of dollars, which would hit our shores and create hyperinflation. Uh, the byproduct of a massive spike in interest rates is, or, or, or inflation is interest rates that spike to the moon, have to compensate. You can't have 20, 30, 40% inflation or hyperinflation without interest rates rising to compensate for the loss of purchasing power. This is something that the Fed and Powell wouldn't do, but the market would demand or your currency becomes toilet paper at that point. Right. And the thing of it is, is that the banks, which are over, uh, over leveraged and undercapitalized, the insurance companies are loaded in treasuries, the real estate market, the stock market, the bond market, it's all inversely correlated to a massive spike in interest rates. So if it happened, uh, God help us if it does, it would be the Great Reset that Klaus Schwab talks about. It would be the beginning of the end. It would be a religious experience for most people who are completely uh, invested in dollars. And because the dollar and all of the corollary assets surrounding it would be clobbered. Um, you know, I always get a little bit nervous in giving credence to a specific date. Now, I speak and I live in a world of probabilities. And in my world, the probability of that ultimately happening is tremendous. Is it going to happen in, you know, some are saying June 6th with this tomorrow, or is it going to happen in three days, four days on the 9th? Don't know. But I would say to you that the probability of it ultimately happening necessitates getting your house in order prior to it, it happening. And if indeed it is happening tomorrow or on the 9th, we are very late in the game. You better get off this podcast as soon as we're done and get out and get your house in order. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if it happens, but there is a certain amount of logic that would say, hmm, that's interesting. Now, uh, I haven't heard your take on it, but I did read John Little's take on it uh, from Substack uh, um, uh, Silver Pick, pick uh, Pickaxe, excuse me, Silver Pickaxe. Um, and he is saying that, you know, the Saudis have already told everyone that indeed this is going to happen. Now, don't know. I haven't heard it. I've looked around for it and see some people talking about it, yourself included. But mm -hmm. I guess we'll see. Because, John, if it does happen in the next few days, it's going to be a very, very, very unsettling experience for most people. 100%. 100%. And, uh, and I really value your, your expertise and your analysis on it. So thank you for that. Following that up as a dovetail question, Andy, 
Um, I'm going to give you kind of a two-part question. That's okay. Cause I know, I know you got a lot rattling up there. No, that's uh, all good. Yeah. Cause you, cause you talk about this stuff every day anyway, in other podcasts, but we have the fed, we know at some point they're going to announce a rate cut and we know what that's going to do to what you just talked about with respect to hyperinflation. You couple that on the back, Sandy, of what Greg Manorino, fellow partner we know well, uh, called out $517 billion in unrealized losses hitting the banking systems. We saw what happened with the market this week with GME. They had a double spike in the stock, and all of a sudden, it just magically, they stopped the markets, right? Stopping the profits. Um, how many banks will be affected by this, and how much longer will the Fed be able to pump up the 10-year Treasury bond yield in your estimation? Well, you know, 517 billion and 63 problem banks, there's probably a whole hell of a lot more in that. And um, a lot would be affected. And and who in their right mind would buy a 10-year treasury right now when, you know, the West has proven if we don't align ideologically, we'll take your treasuries. And that would be a foreign country like Russia. The foreign countries that have been buying our treasuries for a very long time are now selling our treasuries. And this is one of the reasons rates have stayed up. They're dumping treasuries in favor of gold. If you look at a chart of the Chinese divestment of treasuries and, and acquisition of gold, they are charts moving in an opposite directions like this. Um, it, it's something that is a trend in motion. And how, I mean, the question is who in their right mind would buy it? If you, if we do see a lowering of rates, remember they said there would be four and then two and then maybe one, and then maybe we even raise rates. I don't know that they will raise or lower rates. If they do, they are signaling to the world that we will never normalize our balance sheet, that we have chosen inflation over austerity. And then ask yourself, who's going to buy a 10-year treasury in a country that has proven they will never get their balance sheet in order? And it's hard to do when you have almost $200 trillion in debt, which is Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and government military pensions that are off balance sheet, but owed to us. When you talk about a defaulting on the system, if that were to happen, in the majority of the debts owed to the American public, as all of these countries for the last year and a half, in large part due to the Fed raising rates by 500 basis points in a few months and then weaponizing the dollar, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's going to take a whole heck of a lot more than 5% to entice these people to buy our treasuries, especially with any duration of 10 years. Um, and, and so can they really lower rates? If they do, who's going to buy our stuff? No one. That leaves the Federal Reserve. That leads to monetization of the bond market, or that leads to hyperinflation or Weimar Republic. So if they do do that, they've signaled that they will never get their financial house in order. And you look at Canada today, they just lowered their benchmark rate by a quarter, a quarter point, 25 basis points. It's a lot of nothing. But it's token. I don't even think the U.S. can do that. If we do, I think the world looks at us as, you know what, this only accelerates the demise of the bond market. It only accelerates the demise of, of, of you know, the reserve status of the dollar. So I think it's a very scary thing because uh, then you have everyone dump treasuries, which will then just push rates right back up. And um, you have to ask yourself, would you hold a 10-year treasury earning 4% and then they lower it to 3.5%? Uh, you know, it, it's crazy when you look at inflation right now running by their own metrics, they'll tell you it's three and a half percent. It's a lie. The C, uh, the CPI is continually adjusted. They took coffee out in April uh, because coffee um, uh, was up 85 percent. Mm -hmm. And so they replaced it, I think, with tea. So, you know, when you talk about um, craziness. Um, the inflation, if you go to John Williams, shadowstats.com, he'll tell you inflation's 11 or 12 percent. So when you're e even at the 3%, you know, um, who's going to ever take that when inflation is running hot and going hotter um, if they lower rates? Who's going to buy a treasury where you're getting a negative yield, a negative real return in yield over a period of 10 years? And then you also have the sanction risk, the 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 inflation risk, the default risk. Yeah, I think it's it's we're caught between a rock and a hard place. You're damned if you do. You're damned if you don't. And quite frankly, I think it would be the dumbest thing that they could possibly do. In fact, they should have raised rates higher to begin with, um, because if rates were really working, then why is inflation going higher? It's not. It's not working. And they have to raise rates more, not lower them, in order to get things in order. The problem is, is that all of the asset prices that were it, that were ridiculously overvalued due to uh, 15 years of easy money with zero federal funds rate, low interest rates, and trillions of dollars added to the system has created massive distortions in asset prices and in people's expectations of what is something is really worth. In other words, price discovery is dead. 
So if you do that, um, it's the death knell, I think, the beginning of the end for the dollar. Uh, they should have raised rates much higher and gone through the pain of, of resetting the system and finding fair value on asset prices as they relate to a fair interest rate. Um, and the fact that they haven't, and now they're talking about going the other way when they're still, they want to get to a 2% rate. Well, we're at three and a half. They're, they're what? They're, they're a one and a half times away from where they really want to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're talking about lowering rates. I don't think they can do it. 100%. And I'm glad you brought up John Williams because uh, fellow friend and colleague, Bill Holter, uh, we'll have him back on in July. Uh, last we talked, I think in April, he had mentioned John Williams did a whole statistical analysis of, we were talking about the inflation rate. He was talking about the unemployment rate. John has got it somewhere between 16 and 20%, but the fake administration is lying about that and suppressing the numbers, even though we can see on the commercial real estate market, companies are closing up left and right. So no matter what they say, people optically can see that it's it's bogus. And I right? don't think people really get the commercial real estate deal a lot of people talk about. It. But let me give you one example of how Please. bad it's getting. The, sure. the third largest building in St. Louis, the former one at t Center, hmm. it's a 44-story tall building in downtown St. Louis, third tallest building there. Um, it was sold for $206 million in 2005. And it just sold for $3.7 million, $3.7 million. You've been to my, the, the country club that I live at. There are houses all up and down the neighborhood here that are worth more than that. And now you, you too can own your own, um, building. you know, 44 story tall, uh, office building for the low, low price of $3.7 million. So what happens to all of that equity to the banks that own it, that, that paid $206 million for it. And now they're getting $203 million short of what they paid for it in 2006. Wow. So when you talk about this being just one snippet of a larger swath of commercial real estate that is hanging on by a thread, you know, how much would they have to lower rates to fix that? A lot. And then what happens to the dollar? And and the dollar then becomes, and, and it, it just, it, it, which leads to higher rates ultimately. Both roads lead to the same place. So this is a damned if you do, damned if you don't type of situation. Absolutely. Thank you for the uh, St. Louis reference because that's that really illustrates the point. And you know, here in California, I see major corporations like Walgreens that you would think were untouchable closing up left and right. Major locations that are on major streets that have been busy for years are just you know disappearing, selling the fixtures. So it's a very uh, strong cautionary tale what's not coming but what's, what's happening right yeah, now you're not going to have a fast food restaurant left in, in california pretty soon because they're no. paying 20 dollars minimum wage so how do you stay in business at that rate when you have rent and 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 costs Overhead. associated with running a business on top of 20 dollars an hour minimum wage um payments either that or you i saw recently that chipotle has like a a burrito bowl for like 29 dollars. well <laughs> really you know, half the country now can't even afford McDonald's for four people because yeah. you know, I went to McDonald's not too long ago here in Boca. And it's interesting. I, I ordered what I used to order in high school. I ordered a McChicken value meal, right? Mm -hmm. Chick the, the little McChicken sandwich, French fries and a Coke. And it was like $12. I'm like, wow, that's expensive. And he says, not for Boca. It's not. I kind of chuckled. But, you know, think about that. It's like, you know, that used to be $2.99 yesterday it seems like and now it's mm -hmm. up to 12 bucks the cost of inflation of food is not even included in the in the C the core cpi numbers food energy and housing are omitted the the lies the you know the cp uh, you mentioned uh, john williams and and unemployment if you fall off the unemployment list you're no longer counted if you have been there for too long unemployed you're off the list and so all of these metrics by which they gauge and by the way you know uh, when you talk about the Fed, they're supposed to do their mandate is is for stable prices and full employment. Well, if you lie about employment and you lie about in, the inflation, that's 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 easy to see why they're doing it. But most people don't believe that. But it's true. Go to John William Shadowstats. All he does is publish the numbers the way they used to mm -hmm. to uh, calculate them prior to all of these manipulations. Yeah, I mean he's full transparency, like you said. And then adding to what you said, Andy, like you also have you know, like a company like Yellow Trucking Company who last August laid off, I think, 30,000 workers. But on the books, if they're paying them a severance package, they still count them as employees, even though they're not. So it's all this, you know, prestidigitation and manipulation, sleight of hand stuff. Um, 
The question I was really wanting to ask you as well, Andy, on the backs of this, I'd asked this to Greg Manorino, and I wanted to get your take is, you were talking about the treasury yield bond, right? And going back to that, one of the big countries that we're watching is Japan, right? They're in a lot of trouble. They have, as you know, they have two issues. They have a financial and they have a population growth, right? They're because one begets the other, right? If you don't have the money, you can't really start thinking about having kids. You can barely take care of yourself. So they're having a major problem there. And they're, they have a lot of our treasury uh, bond yields and they're dumping them over the side of the river. Uh, I was talking to Jim Willie the other day. He was pointing out the fact that uh, they are secretly behind the scenes backing a lot of their money in gold, but on the front of it, they're taking a 22% hit on their currency. The question is, how are they going to sustain that? And do you think they're going to run into the bricks for shelter? It's, it's, it's an interesting question. They can't sustain it. They're going to drive themselves into the hole. Mm -hmm. um, they may be the first um, um, casualty in this whole thing. And it's interesting I think sides are being chosen. Um, you know, I think you sent me a um, a text just a few days ago um, saying that uh, who was it? Which is the the first um, the first country in in Asia to join the BRICS? Uh, who was it? In, in not Indonesia. Hang on, um, I'll tell you right now. I can't believe I'm, I've had four podcasts already. I, I, know, there's I can't think so of it. So much information. It's hard uh, it on. was Thailand, just for the bricks. Right. Yeah. So, you know, um, when you talk about sides being chosen in the Eurasian continent, yeah, I think there could come a time where you will see uh, countries like Japan make that decision. I don't know if they will, but if all of a sudden, you know, they, they their their whole system collapses due to, you know, the, the Western system breaking apart and they have to make these choices, I could see very well them leaving um, the West in terms of their their uh, allegiance and partner up with the BRICS because it would just be about self-preservation. Yeah, I think it's very possible. Jim Willie talks about that it's already in the works a little bit. So would right. it surprise me? No, not that much. Yeah, he does. You're right, because we just talked about that with him yesterday. So I'm glad that you guys are simpatico on that. Um, yeah, and awesome. that's why Jim sees things a lot, many times before most people do. So yeah. he has my respect and, um, and, uh, admiration. Likewise. And you know, all that statistical analysis over a prolonged period of time, like yourself really pays off. So, and that's why we do this so that our audience can get the best breadth and depth of like, subject matter experts like you guys to help them, you know, be proactive, like you said earlier, and not wait on the boat and get prepared. Don't be fearful, just be faithful and be proactive. That's the key. Exactly. So um, a couple other qu uh, the questions on this front, but I, that's why we're watching, since you brought it up, Thailand was the first to join the BRICS as far as Asian countries. Um, that's why we have our audience in terms of the, the currency market watching the Thai bot. Um, I had an opportunity to talk to some Thai business people earlier this year who do textiles and trade, and they indicated to me that the Thai bot was looking very strong for next year as far as that. So thanks for kind of confirming that with what you shared about BRICS. Absolutely. So I got a two-part question. I'm going to bake it in for time. Uh, you were at the recent XRP conference, right? So, you know, President Trump came out last week, talked about being in favor of cryptocurrency, in particular Bitcoin and other decentralized cryptos, which we believe XRP will be one. Um, the first question is, do you believe he has every intention of backing it with precious metals in the new digital economic reality? And the other question is, we're waiting for Judge Torres's inevitable decision on XRP winning, which we know is coming. Um, do you think that the judge is waiting for, uh, you know, we have wars or rumors of wars going on with Israel and Iran and all that, which I think is kind of a, a false flag distraction ultimately. But do you think some of that has uh, an impact on when she makes her decision? And how does that affect the SEC and their already tarnished reputation? You know, I don't know if any of this has any impact on on what has an impact on it. I think when you talk about Trump, first and foremost, look, when he wanted to have Judy Shelton as his Treasury mm -hmm. Secretary or the head, of, was it the head of the Fed, I think? And mm -hmm. Judy Shelton is a is a advocate of the gold standard. So, right. yeah, I mean, I think that there's a high probability that you only will ever be able to to gain credibility again after we have squandered so much of the global trust that we once had, where you have to have something pegged to a new currency. You have to, um, a new system. It would have to be something like gold, which was reclassified the world's only other tier one reserve asset. And Trump would be smart enough to understand that. 
most of the people in this country don't know that the Bank of International Settlements did that in 2019. The most powerful bank in the world said, well, now gold is tier one next to U.S. treasuries and dollars. After 75 years of it just being treasuries and dollars, you think there's any coincidence that the central banks are buying it in the veracity that they are? India, in the first four months, bought one and a half times what they bought all of last year and just repatriated 100 tons from um, from the Bank of England. And when you talk about, you know, banks going, the central banks are buying more than any time in history. And then when you talk about, you know, the repatriation, which is, is again, a symptom of the lack of trust in, in, in the dollar and, and in the government. And, uh, this is not something that that's just happening now with India quietly repatriating their gold from, uh, the bank of England. It started a few years ago with, the Bundesbank in Germany, the Bank of Austria, Hungary, Turkey, Poland, the Czech National Bank, um, they all repatriated their gold from the the, the U.S. Um, uh, Federal Reserve, uh, Bank of New York, uh, and also the um, Bank of England. And the same thing happened here again. The New York Fed just a few weeks ago saw um, Saudi Arabia, um, Nigeria, South Africa, Ghana, Senegal, Cameroon, Algeria, and Egypt all repatriate their gold. So mm -hmm. what you are seeing is they move away from promises by an insolvent country in the form of treasuries, which can be taken if they don't align ideologically into gold, which has outperformed the bond market mm -hmm. for the last 25 years and has no counterparty liability. It can't be taken or defaulted on or confiscated from these countries. And the lack of trust and the fact that we will actually have the nerve to talk about confiscating the five billion in Russian assets we're holding and use them to buy munitions to fund the war or the 280 billion that the European Union is holding and they're talking right now about taking the the interest earned from the frozen assets which amount to four or five billion a year and using that to do the same thing it's one thing it's bad enough to sanction when you are the world reserve currency it's not our prerogative to do that it's supposed to be neutral it's a whole other thing when you confiscate and even a whole worse thing when you use the proceeds of those confiscations to fund the country that that the country you stole from stole from that's stealing keyword fund it to uh, use it to fund a war that they're fighting against. It's just a whole different level of betrayal and lack of trust. And, you know, I don't care what your position is on Russia. This is something that the world reserve currency, if you do it, you are sowing the seeds of the end of everything that was um, once considered uh, special about the dollar and its status as the world reserve currency and its trust among the global community. So, yeah, I think it it sets a very bad precedence, and um, I think things are going to get very interesting over the next few months. Absolutely, and it's funny. I'm so glad we're, we're tracking once again because you mentioned Russia, and I mean, who would ever have thought that you know here in the U.S., of course, our deep state media who you know, brainwashed and inculcated us on a grand scale to believe Russia was the enemy, they're actually the good guys in this whole thing. When you really see it optically, you know, they're they're helping out, you know, Don Bask and Lugans, who are, you know, those people are Ukrainian nationalists, you know, they're they speak Russian, they're rebuilding the infrastructure. They uh, bailed us out in World War II. They're actually doing the dirty work behind the scenes in the bricks to rebuild the gold standard because we know Trump is you know, working with Putin and other factions there, and has been for, you know, quite some time, if you look on the pull back the curtain, um, they're, they're, and they were, as you know, Russia was the strongest economy or currency rather in 2022, and they're slated to be again this year, and there's no well, a lot big of good sanctions they're doing in that case, huh? <laughs> yeah, 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 we're, well, we're, if you think about it, Andy, as you know, you don't have to think about it, you do this every day, I've come to the realization that you know, you know, what did Trump say with Sun Tzu, never interfere with an, an enemy that's in the process of destroying themselves. We're, you know, Trump is allowing the Fed to careen the dollar off the cliff all by themselves. There's nothing he could do that they wouldn't do more worse off to themselves and the old dollar hegemony, as you put it. Well, um, I just heard James Rickards say there isn't another country that can destroy the dollar, but we can ourselves. And, you know, right. and, and that that is I think we've done more damage to our country ourselves and any foreign enemy could have ever done in the last few years. And so it's very, that's a very apropos statement. Yeah, yeah, it is. And, and Jim is absolutely correct on that and as, as are you. Uh, so let's, thank you for the answer on the XRP, by the way, I appreciate that. Um, let's transition into one of the other many areas of your expertise and the foundation of your company respectively, which is precious metals. So 
it's beginning to become more evident that silver is the key, as we know. Um, they've suppressed the price for well over 100 years. Foreign countries like China and India are aggressively buying it. Uh, Yellen and the big banks have recently met with China and what appears to that to ask them not to buy silver, but more like this green initiative nonsense. Um, green legislation is slowing down like the mining of metals in Latin America, like countries like Mexico. Uh, the knowledge is that silver is much more scarce than previously believed for manufacturing and AI robotics like you and I have talked about before. It seems if I have the numbers right here, Andy, that the gold to silver ratio is seven to one in bringing out of the ground and the US Mint is refusing to keep up with the silver eagle demand. So the question is this, clearly silver is the key, but does our government need silver and the silver price low to exist in order to function and stay solvent? Well, I mean, it, they omit the military industrial complex's role in, in, in silver consumption. And John Little of the Pickaxe has done a great job of, of talking about that. I've given speeches Two of them I gave in Vancouver uh, two years ago and then last year. And in the first speech I gave in Vancouver, I said that there is 500 ounces of silver in a Tomahawk cruise missile. And a guy came up to me after the speech and said, I work for the Department of Defense and I developed the Tomahawk. And I know there's some silver in it, but I'm not sure how much. I'll get back to you. Never heard from him. <laughs> I gave the same, a different speech following year, this last January. And he was there again, comes up to me and says, you, he has these pictures in his hand. He said, look, everything I'm going to show you is declassified. I helped design and build the Patriot missile. He shows me um, a platform in California right off the coast where they were launching, testing it. And they said it was the hardest part was to get it to fire vertically because it was always coming out of the tubes of a of a torpedo tube and a submarine. And, and that, you know, but he says, you know what? You're right. There's between 14 and 15 kilograms of silver in the tip of every Tomahawk cruise missile. And John Williams has done an amazing job of talking about the military applications. And, and he sent something to me, and it's a, a newspaper article from like, you know, 1940 something. And in it, I'll just read the first passage. It says, the present consumption of silver for war purposes is at the rate of about 100 million ounces a year and is growing rapidly. According to the War Production Board, it's only a matter of months before war demands will have increased sufficiently to require at least 200 million ounces a year. Thus, if the estimate is correct, the, the demand for war purposes alone will next year exceed the total of available foreign and domestic production, which combined is about 175 million ounces by some 25 million ounces. In addition, civilian, civilian industry asks that a part of the amount used in 1941 be made available for 1943 in order to avert the closing of many smaller plants and to permit transition to war work of all plants with the least disturbance to the country's economy. We estimate that in pre-war year of 1941, some 65 million ounces of silver was consumed by civilian industry. We also estimate that the amount required for non-war purposes to enable the industry to continue while converting to war, blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> they, they there were newspaper articles in the 40s that admitted this, right? And mm -hmm. and the Department of Defense employee told me that there's 500 ounces in a Tomahawk cruise missile. We've had a 200 million plus ounce shortfall three years in a row between supply and demand, and yet the Silver Institute omits any reference to military. And when you talk about why would a couple of commercial banks, four or five or six of them, be naked short, what amounts to many, 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 many times the number of bars backing um, the contracts. Why would they do this? Well, the reason to keep it short, uh, to keep the price down, uh, and you could extrapolate, is because the military industrial complex is incredibly powerful, and you cannot make high tech weaponry without silver. So much so that the silver industry, uh, the the silver institute omits it, which is very strange. And and so, you know, I think yes, the answer is this is why they've kept it down. But the thing of it is, John, the only way to manipulate a market over an extended period of time is to push it in the direction it's going. You have countries like India, who in the last two and a half years have imported almost 600 million ounces. That's that's 12 times the amount of silver, right? Or 10 times the amount of silver on the COMEX registered category. And mm -hmm. there's all sorts of information coming out right now about the LBMA. The LBMA lists that they trade um, 2 million 900 thousand ounces of silver per day, but they also have admitted that the statistics that they publish are about 10 times. Um, understated from what is actually settled. Because if I buy 10 and sell five contracts, the net result is five. That's all they post. They don't show the 15 contracts that were traded. 
And if that be the case, then they were admitting that they trade roughly 2.9 billion ounces of silver per day. And you're talking three and a half times global production per day. This is the naked shorting that has enabled them by creating all of this paper, much of which never stood for delivery, either on the LBMA or COMEX ever. That overwhelming of paper allows the price to be managed however they would like. They create the money, they short the product, or the Fed creates the money, gives it to the bullion banks, they short it. And they keep the price of silver low, which is bullish for the dollar and allows them to fight and fund wars all around the globe. Mm -hmm. And the difference is, is that all of a sudden you see countries like China who's buying silver at a $4 premium to the West right now. It's about $4 higher in Shanghai than it is in on COMEX or the LBMA or India importing 600 million ounces. These countries, these BRICS countries are wealthy, sophisticated, coordinated, and industrialized. And they are standing up to the West and the suppression of the paper markets, the commodity markets, and they're standing for delivery. You can only manipulate a market by pushing in the direction that it's going, and it's going in a different direction. The gold and silver market are playing by a different set of rules right now. And to me, I guess I would sum it up, John, by saying, as Zoltan Pozar said, this is Bretton Woods III, a system that will be described by commodities, not opaque debt promises like treasuries. And it seems to me that these commodities, whether they be rare earths or copper or gold or silver or even food, these commodities are becoming worth more than money. And the countries that are accumulating them all, stockpiling them all, understand this. And we have yet to grasp that fully in the West. Um, we live in a world of recency, normalcy bias. But if something like the Saudi peg disappearing is in as soon as a day or three, yeah, the world's going to get very scary, very frightening, very, very fast. And I'm sincere about that. So ultimately, yeah. whether we talk about it happening in three days or three years, I think the likelihood of the dollar losing its solo status as the world reserve currency and a system that will be more along the lines of, of something that is pegged to gold, that is more transparent using blockchain like XRP. I don't know what the system will be, but I do believe that ultimately is where we are heading. Absolutely. And I'm so glad, once again, we're tracking on the same mindset. I'm going to bring up China at the end of this, because I do have a very important question for you in regards to them. And I was going to ask you about the price disparity between, you know, what we pay here and what they pay. Like you said, it's a $4 uh, VIG, if you will. So I'm glad you brought that up. Um, so I've seen several states in the country, most notably Utah recently, that has a currency with an actual go gold woven into the fabric of the bill. I'm not sure if you've seen it but they look really beautiful and ornate. And it sounds like uh, there are many businesses that now accept these within Utah, for example. Do you see more of this happening? And does Miles Franklin carry any of these gold back states currencies? Uh, I've been asked by the people who produce them to carry them. Uh, they're good people. In fact, one of them was a client of mine and I like them a lot. I just they're a little too expensive for me at this point in terms mm -hmm. of premium. The amount of gold in them is like a I don't know, 20th of an ounce or something. And it's somehow um, it's somehow morphed into this gold back bill. Um, okay. You know, the state of Utah also says that gold coins issued by a sovereign mint are legal tender for all debts, public and private. And I think if you're looking to buy gold, you don't want to buy a gold back certificate before you own enough physical metal in your possession. Because Agreed. the truth of the matter is pulling the gold out of those gold backs is probably next to impossible. And um, so it's better than Federal Reserve notes. But I, what I would say is that you have a whole bunch of states discussing this legal tender currency application in their states. Um, I believe the other one is Oklahoma is the other one that has agreed to exact same thing. And, they, and it's only American made coins for Oklahoma, I believe. But mm -hmm. others like Texas and Alaska and Idaho and Wyoming and, and Kansas and Missouri, they're all talking about this same legislation. And they don't really mention gold backs. Um, it's neat. It's it's uh, I like them, but they're from a premium standpoint. They're a little bit more than I'm comfortable promoting. Maybe they'll come down when they're more recognized. Uh, maybe then these older ones in circulation have greater value. But I'm old school, John, and I'd rather have a physical gold and silver coin in my possession than a gold back. But it is a nice start, and it's a push in the right direction to break free from the lunacy of the Federal Reserve and their um, monetary policy, the irresponsibility of it, and also the grossly irresponsible fiscal policy of the federal government that 
is is destroying you know the value of people's savings and and um so anything at this point that is tied to gold or some peg of legitimacy would be better than the current system we have agreed and i and we're big proponents obviously as you know of precious metal physical that you own you know somewhere to save for an a vault or offsite location um you know copper and the like plat you know platinum plane all the things that you offer uh, it's just interesting i think andy to denote what if this is more symbolic of us going back to a gold standard with a new treasury backed certificate note as opposed to the federal reserve and phasing those out i think that's the potentiality of more yeah, of well to like to. we said trump wanted to have judy shelton uh as the right. head of the fed she's a gold she's a, an advocate yeah. of the gold standard could it happen yeah absolutely yeah and, and we have to good. have something linked to something like gold which is the world's only other tier one asset that all the central banks are buying and repatriating mm -hmm. in order to ever inspire trust ever again and and the same would be true with any currency that would ever try and rise to challenge the dollar for settlement in terms of a reserve status, well, that would come a little bit later when you have a bond market and 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 the, the liquidity and sophistication there. But until then, gold seems to be filling that role with a lot of these countries who are buying gold, which has outperformed the bond market, but lacks counterparty risk. Yep, absolutely. Um, let's piggyback off of the comment you made on the previous question, because that was my next segue is, you have more and more states legislating laws, like you said, that prevent sales tax on gold and silver, allowing to be legal tender. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Louisiana is the latest to jump into the poll here in the last few days, which not a big surprise. Um, do you see this trend continuing throughout the country? And do you ever see the Federal Reserve, uh, excuse me, the federal government intervening and in trying to stop states from going back to gold and silver as money? First of all, they can't. Uh, in the Constitution, it says no state shall make any currency other than gold and silver. It's in the Constitution. That's correct. Um, you can't create a competing currency unless it's gold and silver. Uh, I think the federal government really doesn't like it. And in terms of it being um, st uh, countrywide, I can't imagine California or New York jumping on board anytime soon. I think this is largely the red states that have em em embraced this. That says a lot about the way that the you know maybe the blue states look at their their constituents and 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 their ability to not be affected by this massive amount of inflation. I think the legislature from Idaho, the legislator from Idaho, said it best when it might have been the governor. I don't know who it was. One of the representatives, I think, on the House floor in the state of uh, Idaho, got up on the stage and said something to the extent we need to give our constituency ability to get free from what the Federal Reserve is doing. And so I think it's a growing uh, phenomenon. I don't know if it's going to be embraced by by all the states at once, but you are seeing it rapidly increase. Um, you know, Texas, Utah, Wyoming, Missouri, uh, Arkansas, Oklahoma, it's in front of the Florida legislature, you know, and it's going on and on and on. So yeah, Louisiana, North Carolina, th these states, excuse me, are at least entertaining it. And so we're heading in that direction. So I don't know in terms of mass adoption yet, but it's certainly got a good start and some momentum behind it for sure. Yeah, no. And, and you're absolutely right, Andy, and a very underrated point you made in terms of you're going to see a delineation between the blue and the red states. And it's almost like they're going to be this great divide. And and, the, and everybody's going to be looking at the red states and why are they doing the blue states aren't. And it's going to put some accountability on the, the corrupt leadership and those blue states. Um, last yeah. question for last question for today is um, you were going back to what I said about China. Interesting sort of epiphany or thought that our team had, Andy, over the last week or so. We know that China is obviously buying in a maelstrom of gold to de-dollarize and join, you know, in part of BRICS and get away from the dollar hegemony that we've discussed, you've discussed in many podcasts. That's an absolute. But there was something in my spirit, and sometimes, you know, Andy, there's an instinctual thing. We talked about it, you and I, offline in the past, where there's an additional component that you can't put your finger on, but you know there's another element. And it, it occurred to us that there must be another reason why China is buying gold beyond that. And I think the, one of the things is they're doing is they're going to have to you know, back up um, in gold because remember President Trump has said that China's going to have to pay at least 10 trillion for all the land grabs and other things. And you have J.D. Vance from North Carolina who's put legislation in Congress. I'm sure you're aware. I think I sent you that article the other day in text uh, in terms of China's going to have to make good on the bonds, the, the railway bonds. 
And so it occurred to us that might be another distinct possibility, whether also oligomic gold to back those bonds in modern day gold pricing and not back to 1913 standards. Do you think that's a distinct possibility as to why they're also loading up in gold as well? I don't know. And I, I don't know. And, you know, here again, and, and I'm not taking away from sure. the ideology that maybe, you know, a lot of people think, and I, I'm really not well up on this train of thought, but that, you know, Xi Jinping and Putin and, and Trump are all doing this in concert. Mm -hmm. So imposing these types of, of regulations unilaterally, you know, what does that mean? Does that mean we're going to have to make good on ours with gold as well, all of our obligations and all of our bonds? And so as long as it's quid pro quo, but who knows what a new, what deals have been struck in the back room. But yeah, I mean, that's really the crux of it all, John, is that it's about trust. You should honor your word and, mm -hmm. and China should honor their word indeed, if that's what it is. And, um, you know, there is no better way to do that than in gold. Look, China is also the largest producer of gold in the world. No one knows how much they have. Alistair McLeod, you mentioned, I, I'm a big fan of Alistair, and he thinks that China has upwards ends of 38,000 metric tons, where the state owns 20 and the people 18. And that was an estimate a year ago. And, you know, we had what supposedly have 8,300 metric tons. They would have five times what we do. And they've been in, using the trade imbalance of sending us, I'm sorry, I'm dealing with some allergies. No, here. you're good. This is the worst time for allergies in the state of Florida. Uh, yeah. So they have been using the trade imbalance of, of them selling us party favors and trinkets to, to mine gold and other elements, even in at uneconomical prices, because maybe they see the future too. So yeah, I think China has a lot more gold than we give them credit for. So if that be the case, sure, I, I think that's how you inspire confidence. You make good on your obligations. And that's one thing Trump did with his promises, his election promises prior. He made good on his promises. And that's, I think, one reason why even people who don't love his character respect him as, as someone who has honored his promises. And that's important in a world where trust has been shattered. You have to rebuild that trust one promise at a time. Yeah. And you're, as usual, you're absolutely right. And, you know, because there's executive orders in place that Trump is holding China accountable to those bonds. And it will be interesting to see if we have any obligations. I'm thinking that maybe BRICS will help fill that gap. And because he's been working with the aforementioned leaders that you discussed just a minute ago. Um, Andy, before we mention the links for people to find your work, uh, what final words do you have for our audience today? And just that, you know, the Chinese curse, may you live in interesting times. We're right there. I mean, if indeed these things happen in the next few days, it, it you know, buckle up, get your house in order, pay yourself first, get prepared, have enough food and water and batteries and things you would need. If there was a, a shutdown in, 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 in credit, um, you know, just think of how much credit is used to bring a loaf of bread to, to the market, the farmer who plants his, his field, he has to, he's on credit to buy the combine, the diesel fuel, and the seeds. He 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 harvests the 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 wheat and then and and sends it to a trucking company who is on credit for their trucks and diesel fuel, which then drives it to the to the mill, which is on credit, uh, and they they turn it into you know flour, which then goes back to the truck the trucker who then sends it to the baker. You know everyone's on credit. The baker's on credit. He he then bakes the bread and he's on credit and sends it back to the trucker who brings it to the to the grocery store that's on credit. You credit has touched it 20 times before it gets to the store. You see a disruption in the credit markets uh, and in the supply chains. You need to be prepared because it's like that. Everything dries up just in time. Be prepared. Pay yourself first. Have some gold. Have some silver. Uh, have some small currency on hand, uh, fives, tens, twenties. Um, be prepared and hope you never need to cross this bridge. But you know, the Titanic sank and people died because they said it could never sink. So they didn't have enough life rafts easily accessible. Don't don't sink with the ship. You know, you're listening to this show. You're already acknowledging this. And there are a lot of people in your world out there talking to the people listening to this right now who are very well read and very smart, maybe just reading the wrong stuff. And this is why you guys don't jibe. Trust your gut. It's a lonely existence having these feelings. But I would say we are at a once in a generation shift where recency bias and normalcy bias always clashes uh, with, you know, where we're heading in, in the end of a giant macro cycle. No one can believe this can actually happen, but it does. So whether it happens this week or, or in three years, I think the inevitability of there being a massive change away from the dollar being the singular world reserve currency 
it happens. So get ready. Hope it doesn't happen this week so that you have some more time to get prepared. But if you haven't prepared and you're hearing this now, what are you waiting for as the bottom line? Um, uh, I know you're going to transition into how can people reach me. The best way to do it, our website doesn't list our really competitive prices that we would give to people like you for your listeners. Send us an email at, you know, and say, John Dowling sent me at um, info at milesfranklin.com. You can ask any questions that you've heard here on this show or any other. You can ask to be contacted by one of our 14 brokers who are, are really overqualified. I mean, a lot of them are on Wall Street, have distinguished careers before they came here, <clears throat> and um, or just ask for the price list, which will be much more competitive than what you see on our website and probably much more than just about everyone in America. That's info at milesfranklin.com. And um, John, you got a really good, refreshing view on the world, and I look forward to doing this with you um, regularly. Certainly, you know, riding shotgun here with you uh, between now and the end of the year is going to be eventful, to say the least. And again, I hearken back to the old uh, Chinese curse. May you live in interesting times. These are sure damn interesting. So I look forward to picking up where we left off in just uh, just a few days or weeks. And um, it's going to be an interesting time for sure. That's for sure. That's the understatement of the century. And then too, uh, we talked about Jim Willie. we've had on our show recently. He said, this is the greatest transfer of wealth in human history. And I, I'm absolutely with him on that. And as you heard Andy say, so we are an official Philly with Miles Franklin. So if you're looking for gold, uh, newsmatic, bullion, rare collectibles, uh, 401k IRA conversions, Andy and his team can absolutely help you. I put my stamp of approval behind them for whatever that's worth to you. And he talked about Thailand. So if as an example of one of the first Asian countries to join the BRICS, if you are looking for foreign currencies, bonds, Zim, dinar, dong, rupiah, all that kind of stuff, we'll leave that link in the description as well. Andy Sheckman, always good to have you, brother, and we look forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. Likewise, John. Thank you, man. Look forward to it. Thank you.